Um, hello, testing my microphone. Can I be heard properly? Yes, you're audible. Okay, all right. Um, I'd like to ask for POIs to be raised in the chat, and then I will accept from there. I'm going to start my speech in a few moments. All right, starting my speech in three, two, one, and go. Access to healthcare is a fundamental and basic right that individuals must have. Com uh, corporations and other private companies have no legitimate reason to have control, ownership, or distribution over the way in which this right is satisfied or restricted. So our model is very simple from opening government. It is that we will abolish all pharmaceutical patents. A few things to clarify this. Number one, we will abolish all types of related intellectual property laws that restrict the ownership, distribution, or the ways in which the, the types of different uh, drugs or different vaccines or different med, uh, things that pharmaceuticals produce will be restricted in terms of prices, et cetera, et cetera. Two, we will subsidize um, follow the, following what is the, said in the motion, subsidies, tax breaks, or the different public interest grants to be chosen by the state. And these different vaccines or medicines will be funded by state funds. So because we believe that it is a public good, that this should be distributed, we think that most corporations or most uh, everyone should have be able to have full access to the information of these different drugs and the full access to the, the different um, ways in which they are produced. And therefore, they should also be able to produce on their own will, um, even even if it might be replicated of other types of drugs. A few things to clarify under this, it means that we're gonna pay for research into new fields of medicine. Two, it means that subsidies will be given towards vaccines, like you know, important vaccines that are selected by the state um, individually right now. And three, because we will also reward people and corporations based on a successful consumer product, which are natural incentives that states do right now, um, because currently the status quo is always about um, both of these. I think this debate is an assessment about um, what type of world do we want or what type of full part of the spectrum do we want in terms of this? Because obviously, to some extent, there is some private um, or private restriction and there is also some public restriction now. Um, so I think I would clarify under the third prong is that any restriction that opposition puts to intellectual property laws, such as a restriction on a patent and its expiry date, a restriction on price controls, all of these will lead to some principled concession that opening government will make. And therefore, I think I'm going to try and prove that so that you will believe that the only solution must be to abolish all pharmaceutical patents. There are two things I'm going to look at. Number one, the harms of these patents and the principle of this debate. And secondly, why our model is simply better. No, thank you. Firstly, why do we believe that the, uh, that the obligation of government is to be able to give free access to healthcare and free access as much as possible to the rights of individuals to access health, uh, health and medicines and vaccines in a, free, in, a, in, a, in a particular way that is public uh, in a as a public good to them, we think simply because most of these in, uh, most of these products are inherent to the enabling of life which we believe is also uh, conceded by both sides, will be a fundamental right and access for individuals, which overrides any idea or, or knowledge on private ownership, any ideal of um, private, private property or individuals' ways to override that to some extent. So in a hierarchy of rights, the right to life is an enabler of other rights and therefore must be most fundamental and prior and premium against all other rights to begin with. There are two ways in which we believe that pharmaceutical patents inherently restrict this type of right, which we believe is to be absolute. Firstly, because we say that pharmaceutical patents create monopolies, they stifle competition. And I think that if we can prove that a monopoly is created because of pharmaceutical patent, and it also stifles competition, then it stifles that obligation, and therefore it is illegitimate in nature, and therefore there's no principled right to that ownership over a patent, which a patent is premised on. The first reason is that often we believe that giving exclusive production and exclusive ownership is obviously a random process, right? If it's a random process in research, obviously people may take different risks into that research and therefore there is no arbitrary reason to say that one corporation must have absolute ownership over other corporations. They may give reasons like hard work. They may give reasons like they took all the risks because they invested a lot of money. But none of this is compared against the risks that most individuals face on the ground when they face a life-threatening um, disease like um, like the, the need, like that needs insulin, for example, that needs cancer uh, treatments 
or like, you know, right now in a coronavirus pandemic where individuals obviously did not consent to a pandemic. And I think these structural reasons prove that there is no, re like even if you believe that they have some private ownership or even if they believe that there's some legitimate reason for them to own this product, it doesn't matter to the extent that it must be distributed to these individuals more and it must be given free access or they must be given some more public access that is freer in nature as opposed to the restrictions that opposition may provide to you. And I think this is particularly so in terms of the production and distribution process. So we say that it is illegitimate because it gives illegitimate control that is illegitimately founded. So it is obviously manifested in terms of a pandemic. It is manifested in terms of life-threatening diseases. And it's also manifested in ways in which people do not have access to this. If they have no inherent access to this, corporations must be able to produce in some other way. Uh, and therefore, there must be no inherent restriction that creates this. Because it creates those monopolies, it also creates those restrictions that also allow individuals to not do that. The second reason as to why it is limiting is because it reduces overall innovation. And I think that opposition may again provide reasons that it is more competitive because people want to innovate more and more and because of other patents. And I think that it is untrue to believe that to be so because patents may be about the distribution of these vaccines, but it is more so about the future developments that can be done. And often the incentive of corporations is to do marginal improvements and developments that are not meaningful for individual citizens. So for example, many of them try to change from a capsule to a tablet, which may necessitate another type of a product and another type of patent, but it is something that individuals may not need. And obviously, they have incentives to try and raise those prices on these products, which are very, very harmful for individuals. I'll take a POI from CEO. How do you determine which drugs to fund, how much you'd fund them, which companies get funded to make them, whether or not they get a tax break, a government subsidy, or a grant? Yeah, um, so I think the, 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 a simple reason to do that would be probably consumer welfare, a standard of consumer welfare, a standard of how of, of, of which states um, believe which bids, which grants are going to give more general common good to the public. And I think that the states are in better position to do so than how the patent mechanism will do that. So I think there are many reasons as to why they have incentives to do good choices and good selection process. Number one, because they are democratic elected by the people, because there are voting incentives to hold them accountable. Number two, because many of these individuals often are not paid high salaries, so they aren't going to be susceptible to corporate buyouts or corporate backing or corporate capture in the ways that patents are when they have to transfer this ownership and sell patents to different other corporations. And three, simply because I think that there are just, even if you believe this to be true, there are just more perverse incentives of corruption in opposition side with the restriction that patents do preemptively in the distribution of these products to other individuals. So we believe that these innovations are not meaningful at all and therefore are probably going to be better at government when it is given freer access to more and more corporations because information is going to be more public, information transfer is going to be just better and more democratized. For all this and more, because we believe that these pharmaceutical patents are principally illegitimate, and our model is simply better and fairer for individuals, I'm very proud to post. Yes. Okay, I'll start in a few seconds. Think that private corporations are great and the government is worse. What is the stance? They will have patents, right? For a limited amount of time, owner or inventor of patent will be able to profit off it exclusively in the distribution. They will have control for the, these particular prices, how much, uh, who distributes it as well. We say the length of the patent will only be a limited time, generally proportional to the amount of time that's created. So after five or 10 years or so, we say the patent will be released and anyone will be able to make it. So they will, we, after some time, we will still give people the right to make it and make it feel accessible for whatever price. We say in the most extreme cases like coronavirus, Virus, we can use eminent domain to buy out those particular patents on very rare exceptions if it's really a life-changing event like COVID. A couple of reasons why this is an exceptional circumstance. The first is probably for cases where you need to inoculate like millions and billions of people, the corporation wouldn't have the ability to even uh, distribute it as well because corporations are limited and you have to vaccinate like 3 billion people for COVID. So corporations would have gone to the state anyway, like how AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is cooperating with governments to actually manufacture that vaccine. But two, for pandemics, there's huge outrage of public backlash. That's why most of the vaccine providers say they will, outdo, they will pro the manufacture it at cost and sell it at cost because they don't want people to get mad at the literally holding people hostage for a huge life-changing event like pandemics. But it's only the worst case where other alternatives have failed. For the vast majority of instances, we will defend patents and why they are good. So we say their, their stance is really, really expensive because you have to spend a lot of money to actually develop these medicines. 
Philippines. We'd rather use that money to subsidize cheap medicine for the poor. The people who need it the most will still have access because we will use their many, many money to fund these people directly. So if it's insanely high, like the Martin Shkreli case where they made medicine so, so expensive, you can also have some price regulation to make sure it's not absurdly high. Uh, competition commissions exist to make sure that it's not extremely absurdly high, but they will still be able to make a profit. We accept it'll be more expensive on our side initially. So two arguments. One, why this is better for research and development. Secondly, why governments have perverse incentives to make the production of medicine much, much worse. Main response to opening governments on the principle. They say healthcare is a right, therefore patents shouldn't exist because they're principally legitimate. This doesn't follow. Electricity is also a right, and it's also necessary for you to live a comfortable life, but we allow the privatization of electricity in many countries. That's because if it's a human right, the goal is not an abstract principle, rather it's about how people are able to better get access to medicine, at, uh, have more accessible, and have those medicines even work in the first place. So if the state deems that it's more able to provide this right to people through corporations, it is justified for them to use this method as so. But two, I don't think this principle follows, because why are you subsidizing even the rich to be able to access these medicines even when they have a capacity to afford it anyway. So we give a principle that the state funds when the other when the people cannot afford it. But on your side you're even paying for the healthcare of the rich. Why would you not why would you send money instead of using it specifically subsidize the poor who are able to not afford these things in the first place. But lastly they never approved how they're even going to have medicine in the first place. So even if you have free distribution. It does not matter if the medicines don't work, considering the context that there are new diseases all the time. We have more research into new diseases. We have better and better medicines. We think that's more likely to happen on our side. So our medicines are more likely to exist in the first place, which they never proved on their side. So first argument, research and development. Medicines take an extremely long time to develop. The costs are incredibly high because you have to spend a lot and lot of money using the best scientists, the best equipment to actually come up with a new medicine. But it's really, really hard to contain viruses, to contain bacteria, the point at which they're getting increasingly stronger because of factors like antibiotic resistance. It's very, very hard to make these new medicines. That means only the really large companies with economies of scales who are able to take risks in the short term have the ability to even make medicines in the first place. We say the incentive to make medicines only happens when you know you can profit off them for the classic debate premise that corporations are profit driven. We say it is very hard to fund medicines because it's long term. There's no guarantee of success. It's very speculative as to when you're going to succeed. So we say they need some assurance that at the end of the day, they will be able to make profit off it because it's already so hard for a company to start investing into this medicine in the first place. That's why on their side, when you make it really hard for them to profit after they make the medicine, they would not invest in the medicine anymore. They will not make medicines. That means they'd prefer investing in short-term investments, like investing in distribution, for example, instead of actually researching into making new medicines. This is important because they specifically create an incentive to freeload. Instead of creating a new medicine, you'll wait for someone else to come up with a new life-saving medicine, and then you will just freeload and distribute that medicine in the first place. So the person who created it isn't able to make any and therefore they have no incentive to even start in the first place. So giving them some time allows them to actually want to make the medicine in the first place. Principally, this is justified because these people worked hard for it, right? They are the ones who put passion and effort. In the same way, we allow people to gain income from their work. We say this is a valid form of work, right? That argument is an argument against paying doctors because maybe uh, they're doing something that should be for the greater good. Sure, but they also worked hard for it that should be rewarded. But too pragmatically, they will have no more new medicines on their side. And as medicines increasingly change because diseases are increasingly changing, spreading and mutating into other diseases, we need to be dynamic and to be able to change as much as possible and make sure research advances as quickly as possible. So those medicines won't even exist on their side, which is why they won't get the benefit of achieving people's rights. I'll take the PY from opening. So if you concede the price controls, competition commissions, and subsidies for the poor, why shouldn't this extend to the rest of the supply chain, which are equally important, such as production, research, and distribution rights? What extents? So we can have price controls in the worst cases, but in the vast majority of instances, we have to protect the incentive to make new medicines in the first place. Second argument, why state incubators or state development is bad. So OG says it's democratic. This is unlikely because big pharma corporations are really, really rich. They can lobby to make it anti-competitive. So they haven't even proven that it's democratic given that they can capture the democratic process by lobbying politicians to get anti-competitive laws on their side. But we'll engage. It is democratic. Democracy is a really, really bad way of developing medicines for three reasons. The first 
first is politicians are bad at funding long-term projects because people vote for things you can immediately feel. We say starting long-term projects like creating medicine requires knowing the funding will be stable even after the next election. On their side, politicians are not going to want to invest it because the credit won't go to them, it'll go to the next person who is in office. Two, science cannot be compromised by political incentives. We say it becomes results based on their side. You have to produce a vaccine by this time. That's why Trump is saying the vaccine will work by November, but there's no assurance because you don't know when you're going to fail. The public thinks a wrong result is a failure, but we say failures can be good because you can learn from those mistakes and create a better vaccine in the future. On their side, it's results-based, so you'll reach a vaccine early, even if it's untested, because the politician wants to gain power. He will offer subsidies only to corporations who will promise me a vaccine right now. But thirdly, states have set criteria, meaning they have to be operate off existing research, existing standards. But to fix the worst diseases like cancer, you need out-of-the-box solutions not dependent on existing solutions, like using CRISPR, for example, to fix cancer. But governments don't want to invest in speculative technology because there's no assured return on investment. So the only way to have new ideas, new solutions, and vast breakthroughs is through corporations who can make those long-term decisions. Ultimately, democracy is a bad way of producing vaccines. will leave it in invisible hand to save the world from these diseases. For all of these reasons, we oppose. Thank you, Elo, for that speech calling on the DPM. You're here. In this speech, I will do three things. The first thing is explain why opening opposition's responses don't actually make sense and why democracies are better in our model. Secondly, I'll be explaining why you, in, you have, in, without patents, you have an incentive to innovate in the direction of diseases that mainly affect the poor and those in rural areas. And thirdly, I'll be explaining why this is broadly useful, especially in the context of coronavirus. Firstly, responses to the previous speaker. Firstly, they explain that the incentive to make pro uh, medicine only happens if there is profit. So in this response, I will explain why you still have an incentive to profit even if you don't have the exclusive rights to distribute it that is entailed inside a patent. There are three reasons why. Firstly, if you develop it first, there's still a first mover advantage, which still makes you massively rich. Like one, there's a space where other people can't manufacture it. And so by definition, you still, you, you're the only one that gets to sell it for a short period of time. That still makes you a lot of money. And secondly, your brand identity gets associated with being the first people to develop a cure for COVID. And you get massive access to like other research development options and broadly deals with governments in other countries. That's the first reason why you still have incentive to profit. Secondly, selling medicine is still ludicrously profitable because the fact that this is a valuable, this, this is a valuable uh, product that like the, the need for won't ever go away. Like people won't ostensibly, uh, ostensibly people won't stop dying of cancer or stop dying of lung, uh, of lung disease in the near future. So you, you can still reliably count on people to buy products from you and you can still reliably count on, on making sustainable amounts of money. The third and last thing is also our policy gives people an incentive to do this because we pay them for doing things well. We pay them for successfully creating a good product that cures the life, that cures the health of people. So by the way, I don't want to get into, get into a debate about how the government does it badly. Like realistically speaking, the government will probably elect some uh, health experts, probably like have something under the Department of Health to do these things uh, in a technocratic way. But the second thing is, uh, so that just resolves why there's still an incentive to profit. TEPS, or, TEPS material doesn't make sense. The second thing I want to respond to is this part about how state incubators are bad, states are bad at doing things. Firstly, I want to point out that this is mostly symmetric because their policy also relies on state action, whether it be state action to enforce a patent and ensure that their competitive incentives arise, or when states or, or, or when corporations like use their answer to the worst case, which is using eminent domain or, use, or making money. The comparative here is that if you cannot trust the corporation, then a good thing to do would be to prevent, uh, if you cannot trust the government, then a good thing to do would be to create, to reduce the barriers overall to enter into the market for pharmaceuticals. So when corporations don't have exclusive rights over certain kinds of drugs, and when you can freely access the recipe and the way of making these things, you have so many more options as an individual on the ground. So even if you can't trust corporations, you force them to be trustworthy because they have to compete with each other and new corporations. The second response is, is that actually, Probably politicians are likely to make long-term solutions because one, it's an excuse to keep you in term for longer and continue to reelect you because it was your policy that is needed for this long-term problem. But the second thing is, everybody wants to be the politician that got a cure to coronavirus. So, actually, uh, so realistically speaking, this is something that probably will be pretty, uh, that the, the, the democracies will probably be pretty good at judging. So, at the end of these two responses, we basically debunked everything that they've said mechanistically. One, no, they're still in the sense to make profit, and two, democracies are pretty good at making decisions. If they're not good at making decisions, we still win in the exchange. Before that, I'll take a PY from closing. So sure. when you go to um, you go, you go. Um, which country do you think most of the pharmaceutical industry worldwide is based in? 
Um, well, it's probably a mix of different countries, mostly India, maybe China, and probably the United States. Um, but anyway, I, I guess maybe we'll see what CEO's argument is in a bit, and then we'll POI that, but I can't possibly imagine what argument that come from that. Anyway, moving on. Firstly, um, argument. One basic problem with the patent system is that it only works where markets are lucrative and profits are high. However, we think there's a large market gap in situations where the public health need is great, but the market is small. And in these situations, patents realistically don't work. This is proven by a lack of investment in diseases that prevail in developing countries. So like Zika, yellow fever, malaria. And these broadly benefit still a huge amount of people. So we think the government would be really, really good at solving these problems in two key ways. The first is that because of the fact that governments are broadly accountable accountable to these people um, because there are a lot of them and because we've noted that there's a gigantic market gap for many people in these rural areas, we think governments have a strong political incentive to be capable of helping like life for these people and just making things better for these people. The second thing is many medical procedures re rely on exclusively patented things such as technology used to make certain medicines or make certain tablets or make certain pills. We think you drastically lower the costs for small corporations or even medium-sized corporations to make diseases for these particular individuals and by lowering barriers you get them access Access to lots of wealth, lots of healthcare, lots of broad rights that we think are useful for people. This doesn't happen on offside because either they rely on a state that they can't really trust, which is, I guess, their entire response chunk, or the second thing is they uh, you allow corporations to raise barriers on these people and pay and make them pay exorbitant prices for things they can't fight back on. So we think the comparative is that the government fulfills its obligation to these people by either through the ballot or by subsidizing corporations that would make medicines good for these medicine good for these people and we, uh, we cure them and make their life better so things are much better overall so the the conclusion to this point is not just that poor vulnerable people get access to it but that the state also has a responsibility towards these people because it has entrusted pharmaceutical corporations with the responsibility of the public welfare but it, they clearly haven't been doing it by raising prices in lockstep and by making things inaccessible to people so at the end of this point then we prove to you that uh, life is better overall for most people. The second thing though, and I think here is where the previous speaker makes a misstep, where they just kind of assert that in most situations, the medic medicine is okay. Um, there are two responses, uh, I guess, or generally argumentative points. The first is, in most cases, medicine is not okay. A bottle of insulin can cost up to $300 per vial. Imagine have to, having to buy an Xbox every week just so you don't have to die. Or a fatinib, a drug for lung disease and cancer that can cost $200 per tablet, and you go through like two every day. So in the most extreme circumstances, these people are exceedingly vulnerable, and as such, they must be prioritized even in situations where it's not particularly extreme, uh, it's not particularly extreme for other people. But the second thing is that, notably, innovation hasn't been working recently. Like, 75% of the last, pat of, of all medicine patents in the last decade has been just minor revamps or revisions to existing disease, uh, res existing tablets, such as changing it from twi twice a day tablets to once a day tablets, or changing them from capsules to some other kind of tablet, or maybe even a, a nasal spray, right? Like, all these minor changes prove that their incentive to innovate doesn't actually mean that they will innovate in a good direction or a way that is meaningful for people. Innovation is not just a meaningless buzzword. It needs to innovate in the direction of new diseases, uh, new drugs that help new diseases and make life better for people. We think comparatively speaking, that doesn't happen on upside. The last thing I want to point out here, and this is a point of framing, is that when they concede that in extreme cases, we can use eminent domain, they concede fundamentally to our argument that it is needed in, in cases where, the, where pu the public health need is great. And what we're pointing out to you is that in most cases, the public health need is great, which is why it needs to be a, a global policy or a policy for the vast majority of medicines and not just the concession that opening opposition has. On these contentions, firstly, uh, we just obliterate them and send every, all of their arguments to the shadow realm. And secondly, we explain why people are better off, but in particular, vulnerable people are better off. And for these reasons, you must affirm. Thank you. The largest funder of medical research in the world, the United States, has a track record of ignoring the worst pandemics to hit both it and the world. Reagan, for example, famously delayed funding for the AIDS epidemic even as it was ravaging across San Francisco and the rest of the United States. And currently, Trump has had the incentive to deny coronavirus even as it is killing hundreds and thousands of American lives. These are not the actors we wish to trust with deciding which diseases are the most important for us to fund. We would rather rely upon the far more neutral eye of the invisible hand and the private market. That's going to be my case, right? So before I go on to it, though, let me respond to some several things from the previous speakers. So firstly, an extraneous point from shared by, the both, by both speakers, that the progress of innovation is rather slow. 
Okay, um, I think it is more likely that the progress of innovation is slow because bacteria are getting far, far more resistant to antibiotics and it is getting harder and harder for us to adapt than corporations don't have the incentive to change. Why? What was the explanation for corporations don't have the incentive to innovate? Well, they say corporations will only have the incentive to have small changes like changing from a capsule to a tablet, right? But no, this is the opposite of what patents do. Patents make it illegal for you to distribute something which is very much similar to something else that somebody's making, right? Which means that under our side, it is going to be far harder for corporations to simply copy off another work and say it is theirs. Probably the incentive is to say, oh my God, I want to avoid a patent lawsuit and therefore you have to have far, far more R&D to distinguish my product from all the competition, right? And therefore it's far more likely that the slowness of innovation is a symptom of a large urgency rather than my cause. And their side will fail to attack that large urgency because they will have no, nothing, no comparable, comparable incentive to keep up with the amazing pace at which viruses are evolving in status quo. Okay, next to the previous speaker, right? So their responses. On the idea that corporations have incentive to freeload, they say there's a first mover's advantage, right? I think this is largely negated by the fact that in a system where their policy becomes law, other corporations are going to be set up as vultures. They're going to say, oh my God, there are other large research corporations and maybe they'll do corporate espionage to say they're working on this, this, and this, and say at the precise moment at which they develop it, we can have and mobilize the machinery to do so and distribute it already. Largely removing the first mover's advantage which they have, right? Moreover, again, this is a large concession, like a first mover's advantage is a form of patent in that it restricts the access of other individuals to that patent and therefore like why are they arguing that's a good thing. Secondly, selling the idea that selling selling medicine is always profitable, this is a failed response. The fact that it is not comparative to the fact that it is so expensive to produce medicine that even a large amount of revenue does not fulfill the 25 years of five rounds of, of testing you have to do to have a large and important vaccine, right? So therefore, on our side, which compared both the profits and the costs, say that most of these corporations are probably going to around like not have a very large margin and therefore are going to be massively hurt by their policy. Next, on the idea that state incubators are bad, they say it's symmetric. No, it's not symmetric, right? Because the, I, the work of research is far more risky, far more speculative than the work of distribution. Because on our side, the patent will already exist, which means that states can have a direct product which they can market rather than trying to sink money to something which may never have a result to begin with. And therefore, the incentives on our side are far better for states and far worse for states on their side, right? Finally, the idea there, oh, well, uh, the case, right? Where patents are only going to work, where healthcare needs are great, but market uh, won't work, where healthcare needs are great, but markets are small. Okay, but which countries are the largest um, funders of health patents and healthcare research in the world, right? The problems we're talking about are things like tropical diseases like malaria and Zika, which tend not to affect these rich northern countries, right? And therefore, what that means is on their side, they haven't proven why these rich northern countries are going to fund a vaccine or disease to benefit an African country which they don't have any citizens in, right? This is probably rather asymmetric harm. Moreover, poor countries have no research capacity, so it's unlikely to have their own research, right? Finally, the idea that medicine is very, very expensive. Like, again, costs are symmetrical, but we'll get things costs are symmetrical, right? Because the amounts of funding will pour into the funding of research will, will pour into the distribution and subsidization of the amount of, of reducing the cost of these, of these um, vaccines or these medicines, right? We're probably only, with the benefit on our side is we get these things faster because we have marginally more research. Okay, so what's my case? So before that, um, a POI from CG. Look, you could, you could also like subsidize and do all of these things for poorer people in the outside of right? But deal with the fact that there's a limited quantity of top talent, top research labs, and top equipment we still have to deal with, which would otherwise be producing medicine for the rich and not necessarily in public good. Well, a limited amount of equipment, like, what? The pharmaceutical corporations have to have an incentive to use that equipment for development of research and development, right? Otherwise, it is not simply profitable for them to do so, and therefore nothing will be done. Okay, so my case, right? Um, two examples, as I've given you, the AIDS crisis and the coronavirus epidemic, both instances where the most and largest funder of um, um, public health care in the world failed to, ignore, uh, failed to address and fund the response to the epidemic, right? Why was this so? I think that many large democracies and states have incentives oftentimes to deny or to um, re reduce the response to pandemics. Two good reasons why, right? Number one, it may be simply politically um, in, um, not very useful for their base, right? Trump, for example, famously does not want to cause a panic, and therefore that's why he does not want to address or even acknowledge the COVID epidemic and crisis. For example, that means that funding a patent or funding a large amount of research for these things is likely to be not a priority of those states. Even more um, insidiously, it can be that these corporate democratic elites feel like 
these diseases target specifically demographics they hate or that they don't like. Reagan was incredibly conservative and thought that the AIDS epidemic, if it only targeted gay individuals, would increase his standing with his conservative base. Trump originally thought that the states which were most hit by the coronavirus, like New York, were democratic bases and would therefore benefit his side if they were to die in the flames of the coronavirus, right? These are incentives which are inherent towards individuals who are in democratic systems because their goal is to win elections and not necessarily to provide a product to individuals which they can use. Comparatively, what I would say is, at least for corporations, there will never, ever, ever be a case in which they actively profit from doing nothing. Yes, there may be some instances where um, funding a vaccine is not profitable, but at least upon the, at least upon um, at least upon our side, corporations never have something to gain from actively ignoring a pandemic which might be otherwise profitable. On their side, there are so many industrial states who do not want to cause a panic, who do not want to uh, lose or reduce their electoral chances, who want to harm their opponents, to actively reduce the funding for for important vaccines which would otherwise have been created, right? So therefore, I think corporations are far better because they are paid and they succeed based on the number of units they sell, based on the amount of profit which they can make, which is far more responsive to the needs of the people and oftentimes a democratic system where an individual can be elected who's not even a majority representation of the country, right? Comparatively, corporations are far more in tune with providing what people need, unlike democratic states, which oftentimes and currently are incredibly failing us and the world. So for all of these reasons, we're proud to take this today. Thank you, Diallo, for that. Perfect. Just give me a second to pull up my timer. I'm going to start in three, two, one. Look, I think OG, uh, I think OG have been slightly uncharitable to Owen's debate. Like, it's probably true that O can, like, to an extent, have the fiat to reform existing patent systems and also probably subsidize, say, medicine that like happens like th that's like the poor really require stuff like that. So I don't think OG have necessarily put something particularly exclusive to that case. Right? That's what we're going to do in closing government. Tell you why exclusively, why all forms of patent, or, like all forms of medical patents, ought to be abolished and what the actual impact of that is. Right? Like two pieces of framing for again. Right? Firstly, I want to point out, and as I pointed out in the POI, right, that there's a limited, it's really important to our extension, there's a limited amount of top talent, like that is researchers, top equipment that is like expensive equipment that you require to like uh, to actually like develop and like uh, like research and development into vaccines and stuff like that. And and stuff like that, like which means that that equipment is limited, which means that like what is being produced by that equipment or by those researchers is an important consideration in this debate. And that depends on where the funding is coming from, who wants to produce these things, right? That's particularly Really important. Right? Second piece of framing is that I think a large part of opening half is dependent on this characterization of this debate in terms of the like the the worst cases, right? Like the COVID epidemic or the AIDS epidemic. Right? I don't think this debate ought to take place in, in that frame. I think this debate is more about all kinds of drugs that all kinds of companies produce, right? Because insofar as you talk about COVID or AIDS, I, I think one of them pointed it out that like like there's always going to be an incentive for either the state or other actors to like do well. And also like I mean like I don't understand this idea about COVID vaccine. Right? Like no no company has yet made a COVID vaccine. So if like over oh, talking about how like COVID is polit a political issue, it's going to be a political issue on their side of the house as well, given that like literally we have a patent system right now. Right? So I'm not quite sure how that's compared. Right? So then three things in extension. Right? Firstly, what that limit in like, why is there a limited amount of like top talent, top labs and equipment and what the implication of that is. Secondly, what are, what are like the political incentives and why would the state distribute this better? And thirdly, like just a bit of like, uh, just, just a bit of like, uh, uh, like uh, for into like the developing world and why it's so much better for the developing. Right. So firstly, on on um, like the amount of like equipment, stuff, right? understand that like researcher like researchers are ridiculously important to research and development. Right? Like I get that a large part of this debate has been focused on like manufacturing and distribution, but that's not particularly the important part. Of it, right? Because patents are intellectual property that about what you research, right? Not necessarily about what you like distribute and manufacture. And this meeting is the more important part of like patent launch of it. Right? So insofar as that's the case, we think researchers are like uh, we think researchers are like a limited quantity, especially really smart people, right? There's a reason why like consistently the top labs, no matter what field of science that you go into, almost always produce the best results. I'm not saying that they always do, but almost always do. There's a huge correlation there because these are researchers who have studied really hard, who have like more experience in the field, who have like who are probably like more in, like inspired to work in that field and things like that. Right. Secondly, there's also equipment, right? Because understand that this equipment that like there's, uh, that, that like you use to like produce like research and stuff like that is a limited quantity, right? Because one, they often use like incredibly rare earth minerals like cobalt and stuff like stuff like that, which is in a limited quantity in energy. Secondly, they're incredibly expensive. Like you need things like drug testing machines, which are like huge machines, which try, there's like 1000 combinations of compounds at the same time, which you can build like multiple of those. Like each one of them costs like 
billions of dollars right so neither the state or corporations can go on to build multiple of those things right so like, secondly like equipment and, and, and secondly they use like uh, like like they use like the, the things within them like cobalt and like nickel and stuff like which are like actually rare earth minerals which you don't get a lot of in the first place right? so that these kinds of like talent the kinds of top labs that you have top equipment that you have are limited are in a limited quantity right? so we think the question in this debate is then who funds them better right because given that there are limited quantity or at the very least like they don't change it significantly quickly we think the question then should be who like what does the, this like this research this equipment these researchers what do they produce right because on this on the side of opposition when there are patents in place they can only produce certain specific things because they have corporate interest to back them as well because corporations have a huge incentive to like pay a lot of money because they can patent off of it and profit off of it right because if opposition says that like again like they can't take a too convenient stance and say that like oh we're going to like have like almost no patents whatsoever then they'll fall into their own trap in that like no company will want it. so that has to be like a reasonable middle ground like where corporations can get an amount of profit right which means at that point of time what's likely to happen is that uh, corporations are going to pay these labs more and things like that right we think at that point they hegemonize the kind of research that takes place right why is this bad because one corporations have like a short term incentives in terms of like this thing right because un- like like i understand that they say like our political cycles and stuff like that, but understand that investor cycles even if it's true on the analysis of political cycles investor cycles are far far more short term than four or five years right investors want quick money and quick profit right what that means is that they are likely to like like uh, likely to only research into drugs that like necessarily affect the rich and not necessarily affect the poor it's like the top labs which are now researching drugs which don't necessarily actually further the public good right secondly it means that they have like uh it 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 means that like uh, it, it means like they they they, don't, they, they only really they, like since corporations have a lot of drugs to care about at the same time they don't necessarily dedicate their research based on like what what drug will like help a lot a lot of people say like poorer people or like and, and stuff like that but rather like what drug they can get into an emerging market and gauge a lot of money out of right which is not in the interest of the public good right so this is an important part of this argument like I want to keep this in place so second thing I have established now is just that like the state is probably likely to do this well and like means that like it's good right firstly on the idea of political like uh, like in that the like the political like part of this right like I think a lot of overall analysis is just based on like large scale things like AIDS and COVID which are likely to get solved on either side of the right what's more important is that, as to how politicians are to care about these things so one no politician ever campaigns and says that i want to cure this disease or like i want like you know this much like funding on healthcare and stuff i mean like, i want this much this kind of specific kind of r and d or whatever right politics is not a political thing at all right? what politicians do care about is one how much funding they allocate to healthcare which is not likely to change on either side of the house uh and two what uh, and two the idea that there ought not be a scandal during their time in office before i take co quickly um fast i'm going to run out of time Okay, I mean, um, in, yeah, you can go on. From O, um, yeah. So anyway. uh, our side actually has a first movers advantage because the first corporation who creates the uh, vaccine actually has a monopoly on that, right? But comparatively, where does that advantage and where does that incentive come on your side? I mean, I don't really care about whether or not your side has a first movers advantage. I care about whether or not research is done to like towards the public good. Right? You have to you have to deal with the fact that there is a limited quantity we're dealing with, or rather, a not so quickly changeable quantity. We don't have infinite amount of researchers or like top labs and stuff like that, right? Like anyway, like on political sense, right? Like look, like uh, like the idea is that like politicians don't want a scandal in their time, which means they're likely to care about the fact that like the public uh, the public has taken care. Of. Like the worst case is probably Trump who doesn't give a shit, but most politicians. Opt into like decent public health experts who have training and understanding of what is there for the public good. Because the most important thing is they ought to avoid a scandal. Right? In the worst cases, just sure some politicians are corrupt. They might favor a few industries, but it's true for like the fact that like large corporations hegemonize any. So on the comparative, it's just more likely to be in favor of the public good because politicians want to avoid being being a scandal. No politician really campaigns on the idea that like oh I want to solve all the ep- epidemics that like like affect the world. Right? That's just silly. Like incredibly proud to uh, propose. debate is about one incredibly simple thing, and that is just which side delivers more access to drugs to people. And that is the burden that OG sets up. That's what we're going to prove in this speech. She's going to give you all the reasons why you absolutely kill the development of drugs and therefore restrict the access of those drugs to people. Considering firstly, obviously you cannot have access to drugs that have not been developed in the first place. But secondly, 
opening government's principle is not mutually exclusive, right? Like they do not explain why the only way you can fulfill a principle of people having access to drugs is by abolishing patents, considering as you know, both opposition teams have told you, you can just do things like subsidize those drugs after they come later, have things like a single payer healthcare system, have things like subsidies for people who can't access them, have things like insurance and so on. So none of the principal burdens they set up are things that uniquely they are able to solve, but we're going to explain to you why far less drugs are developed, the unique reasons, and why that is incredibly bad. The first question to ask in the speech then is, when does drug development occur? And the answer is simply when it is profitable for drugs to be developed. Considering the average drug costs about $3 billion US dollars to develop, that is a large amount of money that must be recouped by a company before they can make a profit. And in order to recoup that large amount of money, you need one, to be able to raise the price high so that you can make more money off of each drug. And secondly, to be able to sell to as large a market as possible, because that is when you are able to you know, make the most money and therefore make a positive return. Considering that when you are unable to do that, you are unlikely to engage in drug development at all. Why are both of those conditions not possible on side government? Consider that patents do two things. Firstly, they provide an exclusive monopoly for a period of 20 years to the drug manufacturer, which means that they're capable of raising prices to the point in time where they're able to recoup that initial cost. But secondly, patents operate internationally, which means that they're able to allow you access to an incredibly wide market. You get a monopoly over the entire 7 billion people on earth, which means that you're able to exclusively sell at a higher price to a very large number of people, which is how you're able to generate a profit and why drug development occurs in the first place. Why is it that that will not occur on side government? Firstly, for the reason that it is unclear you will be able to recoup money at the point in time where other people can undercut you by just, you know, stealing the medicine that you've spent $3 billion developing and then selling it for less because they don't need to recoup those $3 billion. They just need to cover the cost of manufacturing and distributing the medicine, which is by far the smallest component of the actual cost of that medicine, which means that they can do it much easier. Opening government and then closing government tell us, well, that's not really a problem because the first mover advantage that exists regardless of patents means that you're able to recoup that money. This is wrong for a number of reasons. Firstly, the vast majority of medicines are given incredibly complex technical names. So there is no brand recognition for, you know, like the drugs that occur. You, you, the brand recognition occurs for a specific class of drugs, not the specific manufacturer. Secondly, since drugs are prescribed by doctors and handed out by chemists, it is not as if individuals have a large amount of control over the specific version of drugs they have access to. Thirdly, by law, generic drugs must be identical in content to those of the originals, and they are like logically cheaper because they do not have to recoup pharmaceutical costs. It is unclear why in any case, like any consumer would have a preference for the original drug over the generic drug, considering they are by definition identical, but cheaper, which suggests that if anything, you have a first mover disadvantage. But thirdly, it is not as if a large time lag problem exists, considering the machinery for the synthesis of drugs is commonly available to all pharmaceutical companies, and it's incredibly easy to reverse engineer drugs once they've been produced. But even if that was not true, like obviously it takes more than three months to recoup $3 billion of development on a drug. It takes a period of like 20 years. That is why patents last that long. It was never possible that the first mover advantage was sufficient to fix this problem. What is the impact of this argument? It means that there is literally zero incentive for there to ever exist any private incentive to invest in drugs. You consider that the private investment is by far the vast majority of the cash that is injected into the development of new drugs. Is the reason that we have antibiotics, the reason that we have most vaccines. Those are things that never occur again on side government. And that means that side government is entirely dependent on the public funding that the model suggests that they inject in order to develop drugs. Why is it that that public funding is insufficient and unlikely to do enough in this debate for them? Firstly, for the reason that there is a huge collective action problem here, right? Patents operate internationally, so it makes sense for you as a government, for example, to engage in research of a drug, knowing that you will then be able to you know, use it domestically, but then sell it abroad to recoup your cost of development. But now, your national government gains a limited utility from the drug, but then every other country in the world is able to parasite off you and just swoop in and gain the benefit for free, which suggests that you get very limited utility while bearing all of the cost, which suggests that no government is incentivized to be the one who spends money on developing research when you can wait for someone else to do it and just piggyback off of the research, which suggests that you're unlikely or governments are likely to be incredibly unwilling to be the ones to lose the money and be the chump. 
Secondly, because you have a problem when it comes to things like orphan drugs, right? Like there is a profit margin in making drugs that, in making drugs for diseases that are relatively rare for the reason that one, often there are people who are rich and can afford expensive treatments. But secondly, insurance, which a large majority of people have, is often willing to pay out millions of dollars for things like gene therapy for people who happen to be disabled. And that means there is a large market for this in the, in the status quo, but will not be when the government funds it for the reason that if it is a democratic vote, you're going to go for the diseases that affect a large number of people, not diseases that very intensely affect a small number of people. But we tell you that those things are important. I'll take a few away from opening government. Look, your mech on things being too expensive for corporations doesn't respond to the idea that our subsidies and tax breaks also drastically reduce the costs of development. Yes, yeah, so that is exactly what I'm explaining now, right? Like you would have to require the government to lay down $3 billion every time a drug was going to be produced. We tell you no government will lay down $3 billion for a drug to be produced, considering that the benefit goes to every other country in the world and they're the ones stuck with the bill, right? Like you'd be an absolute chump to do so and you get voted out for wasting money. You know, like instead you could just wait for some other country to do it and then piggyback off them, which is exactly why you have a collective action problem. The same reason no governments want to fix climate change, right? Like no one wants to be the first one to make their economy uncompetitive. On orphan drugs, like we tell you firstly, it is even if it is a small number of people, they have a right to those drugs. But secondly, that the intensity of harm is often very high. Like this is people being able to live or being able to walk again or not be in a wheelchair. Thirdly, there's a problem of speed, right? Like when the patent only goes to the first person to produce the drug, incredibly strong incentive to be the first person to get to the discovery. But now when it's just the government allocating funding, there is no incentive to be speedier in the way that you develop money. There is no accountability after you win the contract for development, right? Because in the private sector, you want to get that profit. So you want to develop the drug as quickly as possible so you can make money again. But here you've already been paid in advance. So it makes sense to stretch out the development and in fact inflate the cost to get more money out of government. At the end of this, you get far, far, far less drugs because there's far less money put in and the process is far less efficient. Who is so proud to oppose? Yeah. All right then. Three, two, one. The reason we win this debate is with a team that shows you exclusively how that obligation towards consumers, uh, towards citizens is the best utilized on our side why there are more drugs and why particularly in the context where there's limited resources for development, we're able to serve the most utility towards people. I think talking about, let's, so the structure of this speech is very simple. I'm going to talk about CEO first, then talk about opening opposition, why we beat them, and finally, are we way out against our opening? I think a lot of the problems with CEO case are because they don't really explain why the stakeholders are important in the first place. That is, why, is, why should we care primarily about the profits that like particular developers of drugs actually obtain, right? Because like, even if that is the central trade off in which they get comparatively more money on their side of the house, I think they first have to explain to us why that money is legitimate, given that we characterize why the incentives are particularly in terms of what is profitable as compared to what is publicly utile. And therefore we don't even want to publish these labs, uh, furnish these labs with that greater of an extent in those of money, but understand that they are still likely to get subsidized, right? So even if like generic drugs are produced and everyone else has greater access, it doesn't mean that these these labs have a reduced incentive. The fact that they're getting subsidized means that they can employ a lot more people, they can get the best researchers into the labs, which they're otherwise unable to do so. I think therefore you still provide them enough of an incentive to therefore produce more and more um, in terms of like developing, you know, getting enough back out of their medicine because they can now produce more and more and therefore they eventually build up their profit margin, which was uh, build up the cost of development. But most of we think it's better to incentivize them in terms of producing more and more as compared to being able to sit on a patent, which happens on their side of the house. I think when they tell us that um, when it's profitable, you need to sell to a large market and so on, right? I think the specific context in this debate is about why it's researchers who make these, right? They don't have the incentive of just getting a lot of money. They want to have a name in the scientific community. They actually want to create some sort of thing which is utile and which can gain them a lot of recognition. They are likely to do this even if there's some cut in the amount of money that they get, even though we don't think this is going to be extremely significant. Governments do have a large amount of uh, budgets to, to dedicate these sorts of things, right? I think when they say that like, you, you know, like it's bad that you're undercut by these manufacturers. I think they first need to explain to us why their production of this was legitimate in the first place, given that they arbitrarily benefited from having a lot of those resources, in terms of having those top labs, in terms of just having researchers who were comparatively more educated because they had more resources to be so. I think when they say that governments are less incentivized to develop uh, research, I think they have to first respond to all our incentives about why A, polit politicians want to avoid scandals and therefore they will listen to a lot of people. They like you to care about public health and therefore employ trained experts on some public mandate date about like who like at each point you don't take a consensus for it's about asking your experts because at each point you now have the obligation to 
of appearing the most responsible regarding your citizens and their health care. So they have to respond to our incentives because on the other side in the comparative, the like the system of patenting as of now just responds to the incentives of profitability as compared to public utility. But understand that like the argument about getting international revenue isn't even true all the time. Right? A lot of countries nowadays are thinking about stopping to respect patents because they're so restrictive. So even there, we think in the current context, it's quite unlikely that you get so much revenue off of painting, painting in the first place. I think in terms of less funding from the state, A, this doesn't really uh, happen like because of the incentive of patenting. Like states fund not only because they have budgets and they want to help a lot of people, but because they want to like support researchers, support people in terms of coming up with the cheapest cures possible, right? But more so, I think it's going to be a massive public out, um, outcry if they actually were to reduce that funding. I think for all these reasons, not only is CO extremely unstrategic in their choices, stakeholders as to who they prioritize, they don't really respond to any of our structural analysis or the wide limited resources actually need to be dealt with a lot better. What do you get from opening opposition, right? I think the response to the principle is that even electricity is privatized. I think labs and stuff are also privatized on our side as well, and therefore that's not really a problem. But you specifically choose what is subsidized. I think when they say that like there are political incentives re relating to short term um, incentives, I think there are two responses here. One, I think their model itself says that like you're going to reduce it a limit, a time of patents and therefore this is largely uncomparative because that's approximately the same as an election cycle. But secondly, we also give you analysis about why stakeholder cycles in terms of what is profitable is actually like much shorter, right? Shareholder patients is far shorter than the, than the patients of electorates on the whole. And therefore we think like those sorts of harms actually bite them back because they're far more likely to be transitional and therefore you, you never really get long-term research plans on your side, but government governments can in fact, at least for the length of the tenure, continue to fund stuff. So therefore, just in the comparative, or which side actually gets better long-term funding, we think we win that clash. I think when they say that like it's harder to produce and only big companies can, we think that's precisely true, right? But at the point at which like one particular lab gets like sets out the formula, we think at that point it becomes a lot easier, right? Because a lot of the costs associated with development and research are actually because of the patents that come in the way, right? At each stage, you not only have to buy the buy rights to the formula, but also the specific raw, raw materials which you require to produce it, right? We think if it becomes easier at each stage for a lot of different consumers, we think a large part of the cost of producing in the first place is mitigated. Therefore, we literally get a lot more drugs on our side of the house because the main barriers to, to production are actually taken away. More people get incentivized to research because they actually see a propensity of being able to contribute something as compared to the status quo where they believe that they will never be able to override patents. For all those reasons, we think we're able to claim how on our side we actually get far better access to medicines in the first place. I think when they say that like, oh, this is likely to be result-based funding as compared to scientifically backed fund, like uh, out-of-the-box medicine, right? I think they never explained to us why out-of-the-box medicine is going to get funded exp uh, on their side if it's still so dependent on like, corporate motives and like their their funding cycles and so on and so forth right but i think like even if it's true that like you lose out on some um, some medicines which are out of the box out of the box medicines are just far less utile in general right we think in some cases they can be developed on our side as well and like some of the richest labs produce produces and then subsidize them or oh, before i move on very quickly can i take opening all right um so I think like, if, so even if it's true that like it is to some extent result based, we think it's just better that it's result based because that's why you're exclusively able to uh, like furnish your obligation which you have towards people, right? So sure, there may be one or two medicines which could have been breakthrough cures, but you still get sufficient amounts of cures on our side when you're able to have far better distribution of that kind of cure. So therefore, in terms of weighing about who gets far more, far more utile medicine, we think we win that clash, right? We think so you have to trade off like unassured medicine on their side, which like currently gets a lot of funding and is prohibitive versus the kind of more equitable funding that you get on our side. Finally, what, what is the importance of extension in this round and why we beat our opening, right? I think firstly, we characterize this about researchers and not necessarily about manufacturers themselves, making it far more important as to how these, like the principle of like limit, limitations becomes far more uh, far, far more uh, relevant in, in terms of our case, right? It's not just about the fact that like it's a random process of allocation, but literally because constrained resources belong in different places and that's specifically why states have an obligation. Secondly, we prove to you why political incentives are actually more likely to align and give you a counterfactual as to what the incentives look like on their side. Why it's just far more likely that you get that change. We think on our side, the developing world is able to pro like is able to get far more medicines. There's far better incentives for politicians to actually get the get those sorts of treatments. We think on, on the whole, not only are we uh, furnishing that principle, that obligation that states have towards people, we get far better development, far better preparedness for the kinds of epidemics that we are facing on a regular basis. And that's why we win this debate. Right, I will start my speech in three, two, one.
Whether or not pharmaceutical companies deserve patents is a red herring in this debate. This is about what produces drugs that will ultimately save lives. We uniquely answer that question at closing opposition. I'm going to do three things in this speech. Firstly, look independently at some of the more unique claims coming from CG. Then I'm going to simply examine the two systems, why our system works and why their system won't. Firstly, let's look at, I guess, the main independent prong from closing government, which is this idea that there is a scarcity in things like research, researchers, in equipment, and therefore you need to have a system that, you know, is, you know, largely more, I think, government run. It's unclear. But I have a few responses to this. The first is just to simply observe that in a world where they're not abolishing pharmaceutical companies, they will still ultimately dictate the ways in which that those resources are used. And to the extent that there's competition between the private sector and the public sector, obviously, even in a world without patents, companies will still likely be able to pay more to afford those things. So therefore, they don't solve that problem. But secondly, we would say that that kind of assumes also that you have a lot of money on your side to be able to fund those things through governments. Obviously, there's a scarcity, there's limited health budgets. So it's unclear that you can change that dynamic in any meaningful way. The third observation I'd make, though, is just that there are some levers that the government has at its disposal at its disposal to address those problems, like, for example, funding university spots in medical fields more that does not require us to fundamentally change the system in a way that will make it worse. And fourthly, I would say that this is only a problem insofar as you think that pharmaceutical companies are using these resources badly. We don't think that is true for reasons that I'll explain more in my case. So that is, I think, some of the more independent things of closing government's case dealt with. The rest will be integrated. Let's firstly look at why we think the current system is good and why it works. We give you quite a few uh, unique uh, reasons at closing opposition for why specifically this painted system beyond just like the more sort of generic material of uh, it rewards innovation actually means that it is uniquely important. The first reason we give is that you are able to do things like raise price in a way that you wouldn't in a world where you do have competition. I know that seems sort of a bit icky to us debaters, like, oh, price, that seems bad, but it is crucial to be able to do that in order to recoup what Uda explains is an astronomical investment, right? You're also able to do that though over a significant period being, you know, in many jurisdictions, 20 years, that is necessary to recoup that huge amount of investment. The second thing, though, that we explain, which is important, is that the patent system uniquely rewards speed. You have a first mover advantage. Now, I think like opening up might hint at this, but they don't explain why this is important. The reason it is obviously important is you obviously want to be the first that patents that thing. And that can actually make the difference between whether you're patenting something now or in six months into the future. Obviously, we wouldn't compromise safety. Like, you still have to go through the testing that is required to approve that drug. But that sort of time can actually make a huge difference. If we're talking about the coronavirus or any other type of disease that, have, that has rampaged the world, developing a cure six months or a year sooner means you save thousands of thousands of lives there is no such urgency under their system again we uniquely bring you that we also explain at Uday that we get cross-jurisdictional enforcement because you're able to do things like have patent protection that exists across borders which means that you have a sense of security that another country is not just going to have a knockoff drug that copies yours and like develops it for half the price you cannot achieve that under our under their side. The only response we get to all the, the, those litany of reasons is simply that, well, that's all well and good, but they just don't have the right incentives. So they're not going to go about that production in a way that is good. But like, I would just ask, you know, intuition pump here, what are all these drugs that pharmaceutical companies are producing that are just like profitable, but don't serve any public utility? Like people are buying them, but God darn, they just do not help anyone. That seems insane to me. Obviously, there's a huge correlation between those things, right? Let's now deal with the uh, opposition's qualms with the, the patent system. The first is one of access. I think this is dealt with pretty well in both the opening half and in Udai's speech, but we say we can obviously have things like public healthcare systems. And in fact, I would probably add that you're more likely to have the political capital to do those things when you don't have the pharmaceutical industry up your ass for over-regulating them, right? But we can also do things like regulate the worst form of practices like patent hoarding and 
I would also observe that to the extent that pharmaceutical monopolies exist, access issues are likely to be somewhat equivalent on either side. This is just about how the government responds to that. The only thing that opposition say in response to this is like, ah, but it's a principal concession, uh, you know, if you're doing some form of regulation. No, like 20 years is still quite a long period of time. You still get quite a lot of profits. We don't think it's a concession to have very limited restrictions that still largely uh, reward that system. So at the end of that clash, I think it's clear that our, this system is extremely beneficial and we provide unique reasons why. Uh, before I move on though, I'll take a PY from OG. So the collective action problem is worse with patents because companies have incentives to steal and hide information by hoarding patents. And this encourages trade wars in a unique way at the expense of the developing world too. What are you going to do if you don't have access to that type of patent in your area? So one, again, we can regulate the worst excesses, but I just don't think like sitting on information is... <sighs> You're not going to do that if you if you want to patent your thing early. You don't just sit on something. You tr you rush to get that patent, and so you have that benefit. So I just don't think those incentives quite line up. Why is our oh? So the other thing is just oh. So they also say that you lose innovation because like you just do piecemeal forms of innovation. Like there's no structural reasons for this. But I'd in fact just say that like even little changes are very important. Like how the body reacts to a certain drug is a useful piece of information. If patent systems are doing that, uh, then that's great. So let's look at their system then, moving on to the next thing. Because we say, because they said that there's still a set of incentives, you're the first mover, you have brand recognition. Udai explains the litany of problems with this, the fact that it's easy to copy drugs, you can reverse engineer, engineer them. And there's no brand recognition at the fact that doctors literally ask you if you want generic drugs at the point where you're asking for a prescription. I don't know the names of you know, these companies. So it is unclear that they get that, but we tell you what some of the problems are. The fact that there is a collective action problem because you just sit on another, another government and wait for them to do something, that, that gets no response. We also said that there's a lot of uncertainty associated with grant processes. Very quickly, why do we think we win? We think we provide a more robust set of reasoning as to what some of the unique benefits are, but in fact, what the problems with investment are. We are willing to defend the sort of innovations that uh, government think are realistic in this case and we also address some of the outstanding issues from the front half that's why we're very proud to oppose thanks everyone please cross the house